So, two years ago, I was in free fall, part way through the biggest nosedive of my life. I'd gone from founding Europe's top tech startup, winning Innovator of the Year, being named by Forbes as one of their top CEOs to watch, to an unemployed wreck. <laughs> Uh, painfully removed from my own company and losing my sense of purpose along with it. 18 months ago, I gave a TEDx talk about that involuntary pause. I expressed the grief for my lost company and lost successful version of myself um, and shared my slow process of rebuilding. But even as I gave that talk and emphasized that there is a way through that that lets you build a new, more honest version of yourself, I couldn't imagine what my future actually looked like, which was really terrifying. Now I'm back, CEO of my fifth startup, Vistalworks, which cons keeps consumers safe from harmful goods as they shop online. In just six months, we've hired 10 people, created groundbreaking technology, and launched in the UK and Estonia. So how did I get from there to here, from free fall to purposeful focus? Well, certainly industrial-grade resilience has helped. There have been times when I've literally cried. How many more lessons do I have to learn already? How much more resilience do I have to develop? Can't I just take what I have and have an easy life for a while? Uh, well, no. Um, I've had support and I've found perspective. People love you, work doesn't. When you've learned that hard lesson, you then have to translate that into creating a company that has the values of human beings, not spreadsheets, that aligns with what you want to give back to the world, not take from it. And hardest of all for a workaholic, you have to deliver on that without neglecting those people who, despite everything, were there for you when it went wrong. Um, I'm an entrepreneur by compulsion. It's all I know how to do. Stick me on a desert island and I will be founding a startup within the week. <laughs> Selling sand, maybe. Um, but I'm also an entrepreneur from economic necessity. I never had anyone to show me the way into a career, so building my own opportunities through business is the most powerful way I know to economic independence. I get up, I fight on, because it really does feel like I'm fighting for my economic survival. It always has. But there's more to life than economic survival, I hope. The point, I believe, is not just to leave the world a little better than you found it, but also to be a catalyst to help others find their path. I'm back with Vistalworks doing the doing of entrepreneuring because I found my next problem worth solving. I found the people I want to solve it with, and I know how we will recognize when we're making a sufficiently meaningful difference. So, is there some process I'm following, and can you learn it too? Hell yes! <laughs> There's no point building a door if you're the only one that walks through it. So sharing that process and hopefully helping you find your path is why I'm here today. Because I may have founded five companies, but there are at least 500 companies that I haven't started. Um, because I have so many ideas, a filtering process is essential. Life is too short to work on a pointless company. And as an entrepreneur, I'm sorry, but if you're the only one that can see your vision, I'm afraid it is simply a delusion. Uh, so to get from idea to startup, I ask myself these six questions. Does anybody... Is this really a problem worth solving? If there's no underlying neglected pain, then personally, I'm not interested. I'm attracted to questions, that, sentences that start, I really hate it when, wouldn't it be better if, it really annoys me that, all signs of unsolved pain and therefore opportunity. Does anyone else care? 
We're all attracted to problems that interest person, us personally. And while it is fine for an idea to be niche, if the market consists of you and one or two of your mates, then you really need to move on fast. The best ideas have several distinct but large groups of people that care. Which brings us to number three. Who cares enough that they'll commit cash even if you can make the problem just 20% less bad? What does better look like to them? What is the least amount of work you actually have to do to make them a little bit ha happier? And are there enough people willing to pay to make just part solving the problem worthwhile? Four, do you or people you have ready access to have the skills or sector knowledge to be able to think about how you might solve the problem. This is where many of my ideas go out the window, from perfect trousers to drone insurance, because I basically don't have the skills to know even where to start. Not every idea necessarily is the right one for you to solve, but you'd be amazed that the skill set you can assemble really really early on, if you have even a vague sense of what you're trying to achieve. How would the world be better if you really could create just the tiniest solution? What would that look and feel like? Who would be better off and how would they benefit? Many startups really struggle to define their value proposition. This question puts it right up front and at the heart of the mission from day one. And finally, do you care enough about the problem and the people associated with it to spend the next five years of your life focused on it? Will it energize you and drive you on through the tough times, or will it become an emotional drain? Not every idea is the right one for you at this moment in time, even if it ticks all the other boxes. So, as an entrepreneur, but more importantly, as a human being, I truly believe that diversity and equality of ideas matters. If we disregard or fail to understand one group's problems just because we don't share it, then investment, support, and opportunity does not flow fairly, and the world does not get better. We end up with more electric scooters and fancy yoga pants instead of products that change or even save lives. The underlying power of those six steps is that not only do they help you focus on a problem worth solving, all that validation can be achieved on paper really, really quickly without raising money and without spending any cash. There are many startup myths but the biggest one of all is that raising investment comes at the beginning. You have an idea, you raise the money, you start. No! The beginning of the process, what I'm talking about here, is about learning, validating, and adapting as cheaply as possible. You take tiny, low-risk steps that reveal what does and doesn't generate interest amongst the customer. So you can get past your adoring audience of one as quickly as possible. It doesn't have to be perfect. Perfect is the enemy of good. A rough sketch that teaches you in three days that nobody else on the planet cares about your idea is way more valuable than an expensive prototype that takes you a year to learn the same lesson. Please banish perfect. It's thoroughly inefficient. You'll never be perfect enough anyway by your internal or external standards, and the process of trying is not a happy one. Which brings me to the final, more insidious startup myth. This really should come with a health warning, frankly. It's the idea of never give up. Now, there may be a time and a place for this, but in my opinion, that's completely terrible advice. Most of my ideas are total rubbish. I have done myself and the world a favor by giving up on them as quickly as possible. But more importantly, five years into a startup that I knew wasn't working, that was draining the joy and confidence from my life, 
I was completely trapped by the fear that I would be branded a pathetic failure because I'd failed to live up to the never give up standard. The actual experience of failing, of losing everything that I had worked so hard for, was nowhere near as toxic to my mental and physical health as the fear that it might happen. Knowing when to give up, when to walk away, is the most powerful lesson that you'll learn. Because purpose, failure, and perfect all connect. If you're seeking perfect instead of purpose, then the worst thing that can happen is failure. But failure is inevitable, so then fear is always present. But the long-term effects of fear are worse than those of failure. Once you have failed, you are so much more powerful. You move past fear and can start to connect with your purpose and just being the best you can, taking little steps that make a meaningful difference. So, two years ago, I was in free fall, afraid actually that I'd been the best I was ever gonna be. I was purposeless and unable to imagine ever summoning up the energy or the focus to ever do this all ever again. Um, but I mapped out my problem finding process and I followed it. And eventually I found one that worked for me. It wasn't the one initially, it was just one of many ideas. But ultimately, Vistalworks earned the right to become my single point of focus. But because I'd learned those lessons of resilience and perspective, and now know that work does not love you, people do, that business purpose aligns with what I want to give back to the world as an individual. So if we reflect back on those six steps again, why does this just have to be about startups? It seems to me that this is a path, one of many possible routes, to unlocking good together. Finding a problem worth solving that other people care about enough to commit to. Painting a picture of what better looks like. Pooling your skills so you can figure out where you might start and how you'll recognize when you are making a difference. And if the love and enthusiasm is there, it'll generate the energy that you need to carry you and other people into the execution phase where a whole new set of challenges apply. The execution of any plan, personal or business, is still very hard, but it's impossible if you don't know where you're going or why. You can use these steps to find your personal focus. You can use it with peers and colleagues. And once you do find your problem worth solving, and define how you'll recognize those small but meaningful differences when you make them, then you really will leave the world a better place than you found it. I'm Vicky Brock, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>